Hi, I'm Nigel Griffiths. I work in the Advanced Technology Centre in the UK, which is part of IBM Europe. In this technical hands-on movie, we're going to look at memory protection keys. To get access to this, you need a Power 6 base machine running a recent level of ARX 5.3 or ARX 6. It's an old programming problem when code has stray pointers that the, is causing corruption of memory. It's even worse because when you corrupt it, it may actually carry continue running for many hours, days or months before it actually goes wrong and makes it very difficult to actually track down. Now kernel programmers are like this feature, they tend to call it storage keys because they see memory as a slow storage device. But even there, when they switched this new feature on, they actually found some third-party device drivers actually making mistakes inside the AIX kernel, and having identified those, they have now been eliminated. But the same feature can be used with user programs. One thing to note though, this is not a security feature. It is a feature for tracking down mutually cooperating programs and finding out where they're going wrong. And this should lead to higher reliability. A modern machine has billions of pages and these locks and checks have to be formed very, very quickly, far faster than we can actually access memory. So we actually have a low number of locks and any one of those locks can be associated with a particular memory page. By default the lock is the public lock and memory just works as normal. But a program can change the lock assigned to a particular page of memory. To do this they use this UKEY PROTECT system call. You give it the address and that must be page aligned, then the size and it must be a multiple uh, of the page size and of course AX now has four different page sizes so we have to be aware of that. So now we have the memory locked we have to work out how to get a key to access it. Well, we have a new data type called a user key set here and we define three of them. We have to initialize them before we actually use them and then we're going to initialize our reader key and our writer key as you can see here with the, the user key add key and the read key we're going to give read access to and the writer key we give read write access to it. Once we have our keys we decide which we've got in our hand and this is what's called the, uh, the user key set activate and so that says at the moment we have the writer key in our hand and now we can read and write those locked memory pages. Now if we want to call a piece of code that we don't want to give it the full read write access this is what we do. Instead we're going to here activate the reader key then we can call that function and if it tries to write access to the locked piece of memory we'll get a signal generated as sig seg v. And the same on the second example here if we want to call a piece of code that has no access to a protected memory then again we can call it with a key called none that we initialized earlier and then if it does a read or a write access to this memory we'll get the signal generated. Well, let's have a look at a small worked example I have two versions of a program here. The simpler one is MEM3, so we'll have a look at that now. We have a standard set of header files at the top here. There's an extra one here for these uh, user key access. Two macros here that uh, just make the code a little bit simpler to uh, read and keep it uh, down to a number of lines. Here is the data that we actually want to protect. A uh, rather funny size piece of data. That means we'll have to round that up when we actually want to protect particular pages of memory. Here we actually have the two keys that we're going to use and then here we have two functions which are, are going to read and write our data and we'll use our keys to control these whether they work or not. So this would be the user written code for example in perhaps a database stored procedure. Now when we have a problem with uh, memory protection then uh, we're going to call a signal handler and in this case the signal handler is to simply prints out which signal it got and uh, then it will stop the program. If we now look at our main program we'll follow the uh, logic of the code. The first thing we have to do is called key enable. This is, switches on our user key access and it returns the number of keys so we'll just print that out. The next thing we have to do is to work out what sort of page size we would return when we actually allocate memory. We're going to use the VM get info system call to do that and it will tell us how big our memory pages are. Then we're going to take our memory and uh, use the roundup macro here to round it up to the number of pages we need. And then we're going to call this POSIX mem align, which is like a malloc 
call but will give us uh, the block of data on a memory boundary which we need to then actually set our locks against. In phase two then we're actually going to just write to the memory just to prove we can do it. Then we're going to protect this memory is the call. We're going to give it the pointer to it and this uh, size of the memory that we want to protect it. Once we've done that we can then work through our keys. Let's uh, scroll down a bit. Okay, so we have it protected. Let's go and create some keys so we can get into that memory. We'll initialize this uh, reader key and then we'll add to that the read permission to it. We we'll actually copy the uh, reader here to the uh, writer and then we also add the read write permission to the writer key. Finally, that's just created our keys. To get that key in our hands so we can open a, a lock, we use the activate and we're going to activate the writer key to start with. Then down the bottom we're actually going to run our tests uh, accessing the uh, memory. So we've got the writer key in here, so we've got the writer key and it should work to read it and it should work to write it. Then we're going to switch to activate the read only key. So when we do that we should be able to access it for reading but when we try to access it for writing that should fail and we should uh, find that as a call to our signal handler and then it should stop. So let's just run that program now. So we can see here we get two memory keys, a disappointingly low number of keys that we have access to as a user program. We find that we're it's just a regular program so we've got 4K pages as you might expect. Uh, data size is a bit over that so we round that up to two data pages and we can see here the address has got uh, zeros in the bottom bits as it's page aligned. Then we can see we, we use the uh, as the read write key, the reads and writes should work. Then we went to read only and the read should work and the write should fail and we got a core dump. Now if we look with uh, the debugger at the uh, program and the core file that tells us that where we actually failed and why we failed segment uh, violation and uh, on line 25 and if we VI that program line 25 there we have that line in the writer that calls the memory violation so now as a programmer we can go and uh, fix that in our code Now there's another option that we, we got where we could actually uh, use long jump and set jump to recover from these problems and that's what we do in this uh, other version of the code, it's a bit longer so we won't go through the code but again we find uh, much the same uh, algorithm here two memory keys, we've had to increase the size of the uh, memory then we have did a read and writer, that should work, then we did a read only, the read worked, the write failed we ended up in the signal handler here but we're actually uh, running now in our signal handler there are no access to the keys inside the signal handler so we've changed to be the, the read write key so that the signal handler here can actually access the uh, data and then it's asking us do you want to do a long jump back to the main code and then avoid making this uh, call to the function that caused us to fail so yes we'll do that and We've gone back, we've recovered from our long jump into our main code and uh, then we're going to carry on working. Now we're doing a test for no access at all. So in this case the read should fail and it did and again we've got back to the signal handler. So you can get the idea that a perhaps a database running a stored procedure or a user written piece of code can actually recover from the badly written piece of code and carry on running. This file has a number of things that you should be aware of before you start using these memory keys. If you're running the older ARX 5.2, uh, this maintenance level, then you would just get a return of no keys. If you're using an older version of ARX, then you'll find that the memory keys library is not available, so you can't start your program. 
If you're using AX 5.3, maintenance level 6 or above, then you'll be returned with the number of keys available to you, but if you're not on a Power 6 machine, which is mandatory, then you'll get an error returned. If you're on older versions of AIX, you could put your key access functions into a loadable module and then decide whether to load that module at runtime. There is a very limited number of real keys on the system and uh, it's, you're encouraged to use sort of virtual keys and move the real keys around uh, when you recompile your program so that you can actually test various modules inside your code. You also have to decide what to do if you have a memory protection signal generated. You can catch it and find out where in that program it actually happens. You could then stop your program, but that's sort of disastrous for your users. You could let the program continue to run, uh, hoping that we've got away with this for a long time, so maybe it'll work this time, we'll go and fix the bug for real. Or you could decide that if, perhaps if it's a user function, like a stored procedure in a database, you could decide not to run that stored procedure until the user that they've got errors. And you can actually catch the uh, signal and then do a set jump, long jump back into your program to work around the problem. The memory keys are ignored for CPUs that are reading program instructions from memory. That would be very difficult as it does uh, read ahead of your instruction stream. As a warning that uh, memory map files uh, can't be protected and you have to be very careful with your data and page alignment and uh, we've seen the worked examples of how to actually get that as a programmer. And finally a comment on performance. The protect system core goes and puts all the locks on memory pages. Now if we've got gigabytes of memory here that we're going to protect then it will take some time but of course we should only do that once when our program starts up. The activate is a simple system call so that should be fairly quick but you shouldn't be doing that thousands and thousands of times only as you start a particular module perhaps and then come back you'll reset the uh, keys. And finally signal handling of course that depends what you're doing in your signal handler but one hopes that we're not calling signal handlers uh, thousands and thousands of times we should uh, be removing these errors and uh, eliminating them completely so that shouldn't cause a performance issue. Well that's it for memory protection keys I would refer you to this particular website here. It's a library of AIX white papers and there's one white paper called Storage Protection Keys that goes into this in a lot of detail. Although the white paper is quite complicated and I had to read it three times even as a kernel programmer to get to understand it fully. If you want a copy of the source code that we looked at in this example, you'll find it at the website at the bottom.